and welcome everybody to the afternoon session. Uh, we're going to have two, you know, 25 minute talks and then four 15 minute talks. The first talk is by Dave Termoli from UT Austin, Conformational Heterogeneity and Glassy Dynamics Interface Chromosomes. Take it away, Dave. Um, the objective of mine today is to show you that the chromosome organization is highly heterogeneous, and as a consequence, uh, the dynamics is glass-like, and, and I'm gonna talk mostly about interface chromosomes. This work was done uh, with uh, Guangxi, Changbong, Hyun, and Hansu Kang, but the, the presentation today is going to deal with the two papers that are highlighted in green. Just because I'm unlikely to get to the end, let me tell you the highlights of the uh, presentation. And it is that one shouldn't average, average obscures a bunch of uh, uh, interesting and important heterogeneous organization, which in fact could have biological implications. The two lessons that I wanna show you are chromosomes are heterogeneously organized. And as a consequence, the dynamics associated with that is sluggish and very reminiscent of what one sees in glasses. This is all too familiar contact map uh, that, that uh, people like Joe Decker have uh, produced uh, in, within the last 10 or so years. And what you see in interface chromosomes are emergence of two length scales. If you look at the figure on the left-hand side, you'll see checkerboard patterns um, spread on the scale of about four to five megabyte, megabases. Um, and this checkerboard pattern indicates that the probability of contact between like epigenetic states of chromosomes are enriched compared to unlike epigenetic states. And if you zoom in on the white square, and that's on the right-hand side, uh, you see and that you go to the diagonal of the left-hand side and you see emergence of these um, uh, topologically associated domains and these topological associated domains are believed to be conserved, although we now know they're in fact quite highly dynamic. These topological uh, dynamical uh, domains are of the order of about, say, 500 kilobases. So to the two major length scales that are first approximation that emerges from these experiments, which are ensemble averages or about 25 million or so cells, is that there's an organization which is a microphase separation between uh, like epigenetic states and unlike epigenetic states on length scales of about megabases and, uh, and, uh, and, and then the sophological associated domains of the scale of about half a megabase. Now, there's another method which is much more direct at getting at uh, uh, the uh, uh, structural organizations of chromosomes at the individual chromosome levels. And that's shown on the right hand side. These are super uh, resolution imaging experiments. And this comes from the laboratory of Jarvis Ron. And uh, you can see the distances between two TADs, uh, topological associated domains. And, and there are 17 realizations of, of uh, 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 the distances between this genomic loss type. Left hand side is the uh, contact frequency, but now this is, these are experiments on chromosome 5 coming from uh, the laboratory of Ares Lieberman, and it's a very influential paper. What one has intuitively is a feeling that if the contact probability between two loci, in this case label I and J, is greater than the contact probability between loci M and N, uh, we have the intuitive feeling that spatially the IJ loci pair must be closer to each other than the, than the loci pair M N. This is not always the case, and, and, and that's the first hint of uh, chromosomal heterogeneity. And I want to explain that to you with a toy model. So if, if you think about this cro chromosomes as a polymers on the length scales we're looking at, then the probability that you'll see two loci i and j will decrease algebraically with the distance between them, the genomic distance. And that's shown in the top left-hand side box and, and the RIJ, the distance, the spatial distance between them, would increase as the genomic distance increases. And there's an inverse relations between the two, 
that tells you that the smaller the probability is for the lowest error to be close together, the larger is the distance, and that's what typically uh, ha happens in a, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a polymer. But, and, and, and what, what is shown, uh, and that's uh, uh, recap recapitulated at the bottom, where the probability of the pair one is greater than probability of pair two, and the distance between them, however, the distance between them is less. So I misspoke a little bit. The bottom shows it from experiment uh, that there are instances in which higher contact probably does not always translate into uh, a smaller spatial distance. And this has been observed in a number of experiments and, and also in computer simulations. Why is this? We want to resolve this paradox because this paradox is the first indication that, in fact, there are these conformational heterogeneity. Let us go back to this high C experiment. In the high C experiment, you synchronize large number of cells, and then you look at the contact frequencies and you tabulate them depending upon the genomic distance. Now, unfortunately, a contact pair is not a, a pair of loci do not always form contacts in every single cell, which means there's a population heterogeneity. A given loci loci contact is only present in a small fraction of cells. So that's a problem. And of course, in a subpopulation where the contact is present, there are large scale conformational fluctuations. That's a conformational heterogeneity. So there are two levels of heterogeneity that one has to deal with. It's and, and the high C experiment, in fact, averages over that, thus obscuring uh, the fact that you could have this heterogeneous organization. So let's think about how, how, how this happens. On the left-hand side is a pair, IJ, in a subpopulation of cell, which is labeled A, and the right-hand side is a contact forms in a subpopulation B. You can see both on the left-hand side there are conformational heterogeneity. There are three conformations that are chosen. On the right-hand side, there are three conformations. I could, in principle, calculate the distribution of distance between these orange pairs, those are the two loci, as a function of R, and, 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 and you would get this orange curve where the contact is not present. The distance is too far for them to be in close enough proximity to make contact. On the right-hand side, uh, uh, the blue curves essentially shows you when the contact is present, and the green curve is what a high C experiment tells you, an average of the two. So one has to contend with this uh, uh, in the data, and, and, and the way one can actually realize this is, is to use a toy model, which I then will generalize to think about uh, chromosomes. This toy model is basically a Rouse model, uh, which is well known in polymers, except that certain fraction of loci are in contact, and we introduced this in 1996 for completely different purposes. For the Rouse model, when there is no population heterogeneity, that means a contact is present in all conformations are not present, then we can relate very precisely uh, the, the probability of the distance between two loci uh, uh, to the contact probability, and that's given on the right-hand side with RM and scaling as a power law of the probability of contact. So here there's no paradox, but that's not what happens in a high C experiment. Imagine in this model itself, you have a subpopulation of cells, but there is a contact, and that's given by eta is equal to 0.3, and one minus eta, there is no prob uh, contact. Here it so happens that the distance between the lower triangle is a bit, that pair uh, uh, is greater than the distance between the dots that's shown on the left hand side. Uh, uh, nevertheless, the probability of the, le the lower triangle is higher than the probability of contact between formation within the dots. And, and the way in which you can actually analyze this is to contend with this because you don't know what the contact distances are that here R1 and R2, you also don't know what eta, the population in which a contact is present. But if you knew what the, con uh, some experimental input that comes from some, the, the kinds of imaging experiments, I can tease this out and that's what I'm gonna show you next. 
So the, the objective uh, uh, is to relate uh, the contact probability to mean distances. And in the case of the general Rouse model, uh, it's a power law, like it's shown on the right-hand side of the top box, that Pij is algebraically related to Rij to the minus, some, uh, minus an exponent. It's a power law decay. But that, the, if G were zero, then I go back to the model that we introduced a long time ago, that's a Rouse model, for which you can want to perform analytic calculations. But that's not the case here. And so we borrow lessons from polymer theory in which if I could get the distance distribution between two loci for a given mean distance between, uh, between the two loci. So here, the capital R uh, 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 brackets is a mean distance. Little r is a distance between the two loci. And so the, left, the top box gives you the distance distribution in terms of a bunch of exponents. This is the analytic results are known for the Gaussian chain or the Rouse model, and also for a self avoiding walk, and, and, and these are well known in polymer physics. However, in interface chromosomes, even in fact, one could even argue if such a power law exists, but thanks to experiments and our own simulations a couple of years ago, uh, it turns out that the probability of contact between the two loci is indeed related by a power law uh, to this distance. So this is a technical slide that I'll use. But before I introduce the technical slide, this paradox that, the cont uh, that there is a wide distribution of distances which don't overlap with unit probability was shown in an experiment by Tom Misselly last year. And that's shown on the figure on the left-hand side where the genomic distance for a particular chromosome is 10 megabytes and there are two curves and if the dis, uh, and the, uh, uh, these are three loci pairs, and they are each separated equidistance by 10 megabases. And if, if there is no heterogeneity, these two curves should uh, superimpose, but you see that the distributions are quite different. It is the indication that in fact, there's a lot of fluctuations that are going on, both at the population level and the confirmation level. So if I knew what the, probability distribution is for a given mean distance between loci, that's on the left-hand corner equation, then I can calculate the cumulative distribution function using that equation on the right-hand side top. This is the only technical slide, I think. And, and, and then, uh, uh, because there's a distribution of subpopulations, more than one, uh, that means for a given mean distance, that itself is distributed, and that's given by this blue square within the integral. And the cumulative distribution function that one has to calculate um, uh, comes from a, a, a convolution of these two terms, the blue square and the integral, and the cumulative distribution function for a given value of r. So in the previous case, I only had two subpopulation, in which case the, the distribution function for a given r it's just sum of two delta functions, and 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 and, and one could in, uh, 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 calculate uh, 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 everything if I knew what the eta and the r's were. So here is an analysis of this theory. The cumulative distribution function is something that's available from these imaging experiments that comes from Mr. Lee's uh, um, uh, paper from last year, and they actually could label two hundred and. 12 pairs of uh, genomic loci. On the right-hand side, the P of R, it's in the blue square, and the integral is unknown. That's a distribution of populations. And one has to actually calculate that uh, by solving this integral equation. The CDF, uh, the cumulative distribution function for a given average distance, is something that we calculate from the polymer theory that I showed you very briefly in the previous uh, slide, and, and, and all one has to do then is, for, in fact, solve this equation. When you solve this equation, you'll get an indication of how heterogeneous is a cell population. On the right-hand side are three uh, genomic distances uh, from three different chromosomes, chromosome 1, 4, and 17, and you can see that the P of R is quite broadly distributed. If it were homogeneous population, that P of R would be a delta function, but that's not the case. And, and uh, the theory 
uh, 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 that's a theoretical prediction. And from the theoretical prediction, one could in fact calculate the cumulative distribution function and compare with experiments. And those are shown on the right-hand side uh, of uh, the three panels. And you'll see, if you look at the residuals, the errors are no more than about 5%. Okay. And the, these are the exact subpopulation uh, uh, calculations that we extracted from the imaging data. On the left-hand side is all the analysis, uh, uh, which tells you that the subpopulation is highly heterogeneous. On the right-hand side, you can see uh, that the, uh, uh, mean, the variations are divided by the mean is substantial. That means that the, the chromosome conformations are, in fact, extensively heterogeneous. So what are the consequences of uh, the heterogeneous finding? Uh, and and that's, a, that's the next uh, 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 aspect I'm going to dwell into in using uh, a polymer model that we introduced a couple of years ago. So I don't have time I can, uh, to tell you a lot about this. Uh, uh, we construct a copolymer model, and the requirements of this copolymer model are for a given chromosome, it ought to indicate the two major length scales that I talked about at the beginning, that there's a microphase separation on large length scales, two to five megabases, and, and, and the tad formation on half a megabase. Um, and this slide uh, is, tells you that it's indeed the case, and you can see you know, on the left-hand side that the model reproduces, this is a chromosome five, um, at the experiments or some genomic length scale of the order of about 12 megabases reasonably well. And one of the immediate thing one observes is that the tads have all kinds of shapes, and these are completely consistent with the experiments that are done in Java's lab about four years ago. How, what are the shape fluctuations? And the, and, and, and the, and, uh, the shape fluctuations are given in terms of this sphericity parameter, which we find are very small uh, for uh, 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 the, the uh, small tads. Uh, they, have, they are highly irregular, but the large tads, the tads themselves vary in shape, uh, vary in size, uh, are a lot more uh, compact. Uh, the, the graph on top shows you that the radius of gyration, uh, which is the size of the tads, scales algebraically with the length, uh, the number of uh, loci in a given TAD uh, to the power of about 0.27, which is in pretty good agreement with experiments. This um, is another aspect that I want to briefly talk about, namely the two length scales are also present when you look at uh, the contact probability as a function of genomic length. On the left are the comparisons for chromosome 5, uh, the black lines, um, uh, uh, the gray line is with experiments, and the, the red is for the, uh, uh, from, from our computer simulations. And you can see there's a crossover from one kind of algebraic behavior to another kind of algebraic behavior around the size of the tad, which we in fact designate as chromosome droplets. Interestingly, the power laws, 0.75 and 1.25, are in fact very beautiful numbers, but we haven't found a, math a mathematical theory for how they emerge for chromosomes. And this is not true, this is valid for all the chromosomes. If you analyze the data from experiments, you can see the crossover from, from uh, 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 1 point, uh, 0.75 in the green to 1.25 in the red. So, so the heterogeneity, so that was merely to show that in fact the model captures things correctly. But if you now look at single cell data, and this is already for chromosome 10, uh, two uh, from our, about seven years ago, and there are many such experiments, and these are still six cells, and this is the kind of data that I showed you, which is an ensemble average for those 25 million cells. There are substantial variations uh, from single cell to single cell. That means no two cells for the same chromosome exhibit ideal, uh, the same contact map at all. And this is, of course, also seen in simulations where we generated various cells starting from different initial conditions, and those are the five cells that are shown on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is an ensemble average, and if you want to calculate the Pearson correlation between any of those two cells, that's shown in the bottom graph, and there is absolutely uh, no correlation. Um, this, of course, is uh, data simulations, but if you now look at uh, uh, the data for uh, 
uh, of, uh, of for uh, uh, chromosome 21. These are 25 cells. On the left-hand side are imaging data. On the right-hand side, we converted those imaging data into measure of a distance map. These are the world linkage matrices. And you can see both on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, no two cells, in fact, look uh, the same. And only when you average that, you get this beautiful pattern. So what about the Pearson correlation coefficients in experiments? For chromosome 10, the blue is what I showed you before. It's, high, it's very broad. In fact, the orange, which shows the chromosome 21, is even broader and uh, that tells you the, that, that this each cell, the chromosome, a given chromosome, each cell has completely different structures, and one has to contend with this uh, theoretically and as well as in experiments. So what's the consequence of this chromosome? Uh, um, uh, conformational uh, heterogeneity. One of this is you can wor work out the dynamics of this, and uh, these are some standard things we borrow from liquids and liquid state physics and glass physics. And if you calculate the structure factor, which is defined at the bottom of the uh, uh, left uh, uh, equation, and what you find in the orange curve is that the structure factor has some given wavelength uh, decays with a stretched exponential, which is one signature of a glass. And the beta, the stretching exponent, as it's called, is extremely small. It's, it's just about point, it's a quarter. And, and that means it's a highly glass-like behavior. On the right-hand side are, uh, are fluctuations associated with the structure factor. And the peak in the structure factor, which you see on the order of one second, uh, is another indication of dynamic heterogeneity. Uh, and these are stuff that, uh, that Kirkpatrick, myself, and Peter Wallen has, had worked out in the context of structural glasses. Um, you can uh, 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 see that, that despite the structural, uh, the very sluggish dynamics, if you project the, uh, the project the, coordinates, the xy coordinates of the various loci in a two-dimensional graph on very long length scales. The right-hand side gives you the, uh, um, uh, gives you the bar on the, in terms of length scales. There's coherent motion, and the coherent motion occurs on the, on the order of a second and more corresponding to the peak and the fourth order susceptibility that we show on the left-hand side. Bottom left, just to indicate to you that this is pretty reminiscent of what happens in, 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 in structural glasses or simulations of Leonard Jones particles. And you can see this kind of coherent motion, again, on length scales, which are quite large. And uh, this is another reason we suggested that this, in fact, could be indication of glass-like behavior. Um, the one manifestation of the glass-like behavior is some of the low side would move fast, some of the low side would move slow, and, 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 and uh, the left hand side shows you the mean square displacement of various loci. Um, and, and you can see there's a huge variation. There are fast monomers and slow monomers. And these have, in fact, been observed in experiments as well. And not only in the interface, but also in bacterial chromosomes. The, perhaps the most stunning and surprising thing about uh, the extent of this dynamic heterogeneity is that if I were to calculate the the exponent that characterizes the increase in the time of the mean square displacement, that's the alpha, and that distribution, uh, uh, the three solid squares uh, are from experiment, and, and the simulation results, the orange one is, uh, is uh, orange and the blue are the simulations, and the extent of this heterogeneity uh, depends very much on, uh, uh, on the time scale of observation. Um, the, I, I, I want to go back for briefly to, 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 to the uh, a case of um, uh, a chromosome uh, droplets and the two length scales. If I now stretch this chromosome, and this could be a speculative model for what happens into mitosis, you can see that the chromosomes in fact form initially uh, uh, some kind of drops or droplets on the scale of tads, and then they course in over a much longer time scale. That's one of the length scales course on a much longer length scale to form first uh, 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 these uh, compartments and then subsequently the compartments coalesce, uh, coalesce to give the overall compact conformation. And, and, and um, uh, um, I'm running out, out of time. Um, I want to show you that one can in fact, uh, the, it's, it's, it's a human interface chromosomes that in fact have this glass-like behavior uh, by, by bacteria 
and 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 uh, and ease are, are are under equilibrium control because the volume fraction, their size being small, that the volume fraction they occupy in their cells is small enough such that on the time scale of cell doubling time, they could in fact rearrange and. Uh, and, 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 and get out of equilibrium, which is not the case for the human interface chromosomes. This is the last lecture, a uh, last slide. The chromosome structures are massively heterogeneous. They exhibit glassy dynamics. And in fact, this is a preprint that's in the archive that, that uh, shows uh, uh, the various structures uh, uh, for the different chromosomes. Again, showing ship uh, uh, heterogeneity and conformational heterogeneity. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, let's look at uh, how questions are supposed to work here. Uh, people who have questions should uh, raise their hands. There are questions. Um, Do you see Peter's? No, I don't. I mean, I was told to look at the participants. Just, just hit participants. In your... I, did have, I did hit participants. And uh, look to your right. Oh, there it is. Oh, it's not, it wasn't where I was told it was going to be. It's after Sarah. Okay, okay. Peter, why don't you go first? Uh, uh, this is both a question and I, I would also kind of say kind of a comment. Um, I, I think this issue of how to interpret uh, the cross-linking experiment in geometrical terms is actually a pretty interesting question. Uh, I think the situation, though, is both more complicated and more simple than what you uh, describe. Um, uh, it's actually something that Bin Zhang and I worried a great deal about when he uh, started to bring these uh, things to my attention a few years back. Uh, I was very skeptical of cross-link experiments uh, uh, because um, maybe Dave knows, but I don't know that the, most of the audience knows, almost every experiment that tried to look at protein structure, folded or unfolded via cross-linking, was very poorly successful in geometrical terms. Uh, there are some uh, things that uh, worked out fine, like Anfinson's old experiment, but in general, cro chemical cross-linking has mi misled people uh, numerous times in protein folding. And the reason for that is it's actually a pretty complicated process that involves chemistry. There's the formation of one intermediate when the formaldehyde, let's say in this case, binds with one thing. And then that formaldehyde intermediate has to bind with something else. Um, and that depends on the motions of everything else. Uh, unless the molecule is, in fact, a, a, a uh, very, very specific structure. And even then, when it's a small structure, it's, it's highly perturbed. So cross-linking experiments, uh, my impression, were very, very dangerous for um, uh, protein folding uh, considerations. Um, now, when, we came to, when you come to the chromosome, um, uh, the, uh, the situation might at first seem even worse except the question that you're asking is much more uh, vague uh, at the moment. Uh, so for example, when we used constraints in Bin Zhang's paper for a crosslink, that simply was to say that there, it did not mean that the structure was there permanently. It just meant that there was an enhanced rate of reaction of the things uh, when um, uh, that fraction of the time. And, uh, and that's of course still an approximation but I think it's actually quite a good one on the length scale of kilobases. When we go below kilobase scale, I think that all, everything becomes more like the protein folding problem uh, again, and probably cross-linking is a bad technique. Um, I was assured by Arez that they're very careful about the cross-linking. And you know, of course you wanna make as many cross-links as you possibly can so you have big signal. On the other hand, they don't let it go so long that the cross-links are changing the structure of the molecule. Uh, so so I, I kind of feel like uh, spending a lot of time worrying about the exact mapping of the distance distribution onto the probability of a crosslink seems a little bit uh, like there may be many more complicating features there in practical terms than just the polymer physics. Uh, well, I think uh, the formal, I mean, 
these disulfide bond uh, experiments that you are leading to themselves have still not been fully resolved when you have many uh, disulfides. In fact, even three BPTI, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare. Now, the, the a resolution of the paradox was to invoke this population heterogeneity, and that resolves this the, the discordance between between the high C and the imaging experiments almost quantitatively, both in the eight base eight instances that Ares uh, talked about in 2014. But the second piece, where we only analyze the imaging data. Um, there was no invoking of crosslinks at all. We just took the distance, uh, the cumulative distance distribution function, and directly analyzed them uh, to show that, in fact, that the, there is population heterogeneity, which, if you look back, could be an explanation for this paradox. So, in the second part of this, and which is a paper that we had last year, uh, uh, we, we didn't utilize. Uh, 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 the, 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 the high C data, it was just the CDFs from- But uh, there is no paradox. Uh, there is no paradox. Uh, 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 taking the high C data, uh, Ryan Chang, as you heard earlier, I think today, maybe it was yesterday, uh, taking the high C data and applying the constraint that there's an enhanced probability of the things overlapping as, uh, from that, he always gets a heterogeneous distribution. The heterogeneous distribution also, in all the cases he studied, agrees with what you see with fish. So there's no paradox. It's only a paradox if you, if you go through this step of translating a high C experiment into distances and then distances into, uh, in, in, into constructions. But you don't have to do it that way. Yeah, yeah, so let me let me first of all clarify that <laughs> uh, the phrase paradox was not introduced by me. It was introduced by uh, 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 Furenberg and and, uh, and 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 I forget the other guy's name and, and 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 had but the discordance had been noted by many other people that there are instances when which they don't agree intuitively and of course you're you're correct that the answer eventually is that these confirmations are heterogeneous and if you kept track of them you you, you, you things would be compatible but you got to keep track of them and that's the point. Well, which I you don't have that. I would just say that yeah, the which, which you don't have to clear already from Bin Jong's calculations yeah, which, in 2015. Yeah. Now they're discussed in the in the appendix, but I would just say that yes, you're right. Fudenberg obviously yeah. ought to have read that paper by Bin Jong, but apparently didn't. <laughs> well, uh, anyway, I, I think on. I think Jose is going to have to uh, blame Peter for using up all his time. Uh, so uh, Jose, do you have a very quick question, or uh, should we just uh, move on? I just have a very fast comment. I could comment a lot in the beginning about no paradox and stuff like that. But just want to say that an interesting point that you raise is the following thing. Clearly, when you look at the high C data, you're not looking at a single confirmation. You're looking at ensemble the confirmation. When people just do inverse in a single confirmation, it's when you run a paradox. But that's the wrong thing to do anyway. But the interesting question when you look at these fluctuations is how much the fluctuations on a single cell compare to the difference between different cells. So that becomes a very interesting question to figure out what differentiates cells in a sense yeah. that basically, and I think that's a very interesting question that comes on this heterogeneity when you say basically, if I, what is a characteristic of a cell is structurally speaking compared to just the fluctuation into a single cell type. But I stop here. Yeah, okay. let, let, let me just uh, make uh, one last comment. And, yeah, and, and, very quickly, Dave. <laughs> one sentence. Just like in the Leventhal paradox, which eventually was not a paradox, this sharpened some questions that Furenberg and, uh, uh, raised, uh, along with other experimentalists, by the way. And I think, uh, I think uh, to go through this exercise, therefore, uh, uh, seriously was useful. Okay, well, anyway, thank you for this talk and for the discussion. Uh, the next talk is by Alexander Zdowska from NYU on dynamics, flows, and rheology of the human genome. Hello everyone, my name is Alexandra Zidovska and I'm um, a sister of physics at the Center for Soft Matter Research at uh, New York University. Um, I'm very happy to here uh, today and uh, present to you the research uh, from my lab. Thank, thank you very much the authors for giving me opportunity uh, to do so. As this uh, conference 
focuses on chromatin organization and structure, I I, uh, I don't have to give you a long introduction to the subject. Uh, I would like to just stress a couple of um, important details uh, relevant to the further story that I tell you today, today and that's um, the organization of chromatin in the cell nucleus. So it has been established now over past um, two decades that chromatin is organized at um, from several hierarchical levels inside of the cell nucleus, um, from loops, um, topologically associated domains to AB compartments uh, up to whole chromosome territories. So what we see here uh, of images of uh, chromosome territories as found by fluorescent in situ hybridization as well as by chromosome conformation capture uh, techniques uh, are beautifully proving us uh, that the protein is highly organized and that specifically chromosome territories, chromosome individual chromosomes occupy uh, dedicated their own chromosome territories as shown here in this image where uh, one um, here purple um, dumpling and blue dumpling correspond actually to two distinct chromosomes. So this, was a, this was a huge uh, progress in the field and uh, specifically with the confirmation capsules, as we know and we've seen here beautiful talks uh, about it um, in, in this conference, um, we have a highly detailed picture of the static folded state of the gene inside the nucleus. The, um, the information is highly detailed, it is static, meaning the question that remains is how do we reconcile this static picture with it? This is a living human cell nucleus, and what you see in green is fluorescent little chromatin. Um, you see it here moving um, in real time, so it's highly um, lively and uh, exhibits uh, strong, strong motions, a uh, lot of jiggling going on. So what my lab focuses on is to understanding, to understand this, explain the uh, physics underlying uh, these motions. Uh, so in my talk today, I would like to tell you what have we learned about the host and dynamics of the human genome. That would be my part one. And the second part of my talk, I focus on the rheology of genomes. So what we have we learned on that front? Start quickly with my first part. So traditionally, to study uh, chromatin dynamics, we use a single particle tracking of um, entities of interest, which are fluorescently labeled. Um, however, this type of approach doesn't give us a continuous information of dynamics across the cell nucleus. So the question uh, when I started to, um, when I entered this field was how, how could I do that? And so together with uh, Dave Waits and Timicheson at Harvard, we have developed a displacement spectroscopy that uses a fluorescently labeled uh, chromatin using his own H2B and their motion um, for actually measuring the maps of displacements of chromatin across the entire nucleus in real time. What is uh, very advantageous about uh, this method is it works in a spectroscopy-like way where it actually scans across different uh, time intervals and thus time scales and allow us to determine characteristic length scales of dynamics at those different time scales. As an example, I'm showing here two different uh, time scales measured by these short ones here at 250 milliseconds and a long one and 10 seconds. The vectors here are color coded by direction, so you can see right away that um, at short times the motion is uh, more or less random and uh, jiggly, uncorrelated, where at long times you start to see regions of same color that move across the nucleus, then break up, randomize, new ones, uh, and so on. So we have seen here for the first time that actually we have this coherent motion in nucleus. We can, of course, here as a guide to the eye, this is a cartoon of these domain, domains, we can extract actually the size of these domains using um, a spatial relation function and measure the size of these domains exactly. We find that they're between three and five micrometer in size. 
When you look at this picture, it reminds you right away of the picture of territories that I showed you two slides ago. And the question is, are we actually looking maybe at the motion directly of the chromosome territories? To test this hypothesis, we have actually performed another experiment where we introduced a sty, now only to half of the chromosomes, which are now fluorescently labeled with uh, red dye. Uh, this allows us to determine actually the boundaries between chromosomes. So, for example, here, while we know that in this orange blob, for example, I I don't know if there are one, two, or three chromosomes inside. I know that the boundary between red and non-red is indeed a boundary between two neighboring chromosome territories. Therefore, we can analyze the green signal, we can obtain the dynamic information, so the displacement vectors plotted here, and from the red signal, we can obtain the masks of where our territories are. Uh, have dairies. So this is the great mask seen here. We can then analyze exactly these boundaries and motion that we measure across and see if uh, these coherent domains correspond to territories or not. Now, in fact, we find situations like this where you would have here two territories actually passing each other. However, that is relatively rare. In most cases, we see that it's part of uh, two, uh, two, it's parts of two neighboring chromosome theories that actually move together. So the the uh, coherent domain actually spans across two neighboring parts. So, for example, here the coherent motion here uh, the, uh, is shown by these red arrows, and the boundary of the two chromosome territories is this blue line. So you see that it clearly goes across. So this is what we see in most of the cases, and we find that indeed the coherent motions are actually independent um, of the chromosome territory structure. So the question is, where does it come from? So first, we can evaluate, we have a look at the role of activity in motions. For that, we have depleted ATP and calculated here mean square network displacement, which is an analogon of uh, mean square displacement. And what you see here, this is, um, those are the values for self under physiological condition. When you deplete ATP, placements are strongly reduced, uh, showing us that indeed the dynamics is ATP, ATP dependent. Now, the advantage of our measurement is that we know where every of those displacements is sitting in real time, so we can actually perform beautiful uh, pulse spectral density and evaluate actually even at every length scale what is the contribution of uh, these different length scales to the overall dynamic, and we can sort it by different time scales that we have obtained by DCS. So here in this plot, you see the different colors correspond to different time scales that we measure. The uh, solids are uh, corresponding to the uh, control cell, and the dashed line is the uh, are this, uh, the data upon ATP depletion um, for the same time scale. And you see all of those time scales. We have here a strong deviation from the control at the slow uh, wave vectors ergo large wavelengths. So it is the activity continues at large wavelengths and you see upon ATP it goes strongly down. This is completely consistent with observation that the coherent motion actually disappears upon ATP depletion. We only see a depletion this type of random motion. So we have went away uh, I, ahead <laughs> and started to approach it what type of activities could be contributed. So here to summarize, we have uh, defined two types of events, vector events that can be described by a force dipole, for example, helicases, polymerases, um, topo to and remodelers, and events, those would be the events that actually do not have a preferred direction, but they have a magnitude, so the kind of these things and uh, sources of the motion, and those could be, for example, corresponding to chromatin remodel. So to hear the long story short, the uh, chromatin dynamics here uh, uh, was described by two fluid model where chromatin was the polymer and nucleoplasm was the solvent. So when ending for these two types of uh, active events, the results of this theory predict that the large wavelength fluctuations are um, led by uh, 
vector events, whereas the small wavelength fluctuations are dominated by scalar events. So what this uh, suggests is that our motion, so the large wavelength fluctuations, is actually uh, dominated by the force activity. So to explore that, we have started to look at this in uh, more detail and um, started to um, consider if a single dipole, which is at the order of uh, nanometers, um, should contribute to the coherent motion, it cannot do it on its own, that it's very small, it's at the order of five nanometers, the area of co uh, the size of coherent dream is at the order of five microns. Therefore, we speculate that it uh, must, there must be a cooperation or a collective activity of uh, many of those first dipoles and could be achieved by um, pneumatic alignment of those how that could happen. Um, for example, possible scenarios would be force-induced alignment where you have a transient force on the chromatin fiber which pulls on one end and so therefore it kind of aligns you, aligns you the fiber here. Or where you can, uh, of course, here count on a strong dynamic coupling, as here we, has, we are in the world of uh, very slow, uh, very low rate numbers, and therefore the hydrodynamic coupling is very strong. Of course, in, in reality, uh, both of these uh, very likely occur. So this is something that we have then started to explore, uh, both experimentally and with sessions with my collaborators, uh, Mike Shelley at Grand Institute and David Santian at UCSD. Here you can see an example of our first um, uh, model we have put these um, here you, you see our chromatin uh, in silico where you have four uh, four chromosomes right now embedded in a fluid so they what they how they interact it's via hydrodynamic interaction so they uh, we are accounting here for differentiated um, interactions they of course um, uh, there is uh, there is excluding there are um, thermal fluctuations, and we are adding activity in forms of these force dipoles. Uh, so here you can see to what type of dynamics it leads to. Before I show you the detail of this model, let me here first just uh, quickly uh, show you a uh, look under the hood of the model. So we are basically generating here a for, for, for the results that I will show you a very long chain of five. 5,000 beads that find in a sphere that corresponds to the nucleus. Now you see our beads are connected uh, these links. Um, we are applying then these force dipoles uh, on these um, on these um, on these beads on uh, random ones as as you see red links here correspond to the parts of the chain that are experiencing at a given moment the force dip and then for every of those beads we are basically solving the Langevin equation uh, uh, with something for all the forces that I mentioned uh, uh, earlier and for for the activity we all go solve for the for the um, Stokes equation the Napier Stokes equation uh, here and produce basically both the motions of the chain as well as the uh, motion of the surrounding fluids so a long story short let me show you here directly the results so just to give you um, an intuition for, uh, for for our model here advantage of which is that we can actually test both contractile and extensile dipoles here's a chain when you add contractile dipoles, so inward forces, you see that the chain kind of exhibits more kind of like accelerated Brownian dynamics, where for extensile, you start to see the, the chain aligns. Here in the bottom row, you can see three movies now for the Brownian and extensile case uh, for the long chain now in the confinement. And as you can see over time, these two guys, the Brownian and contractile case, uh, look rather similar. Similar when you do a quantitative analysis, you will see the contractile case uh, behaves a little bit as an accelerated Brownian dynamics. Extensile case you see has developed here beautifully. It starts to lead to this alignment of uh, the fiber, and it um, leads actually to uh, also, as I will show you, to large-scale nucleoplasmic flows. So let me compare these results with our experimental data. 
So first, here um, uh, to uh, have what I have shown you. So in vivo, when you um, measure the passive and the active for the ATP depleted and the control nucleus, we can obtain the DCS maps and we can evaluate the uh, autocorrelation function, which uh, the red data here is from the control cell, shows us of the coherency uh, increasing with the increasing time lag and the blue curves are corresponding to the ATP depleted case where you see there's no coherence at any time scale. Now let me show you the results from our models. So here we again, so this is our Brownian case, contractile, uh, extensile. Here are the corresponding DCS maps. When we calculate the um, correlation function here in the same way, what you will see that for the Brownian case, this is blue, there is no correlation similarly as for ATP depleted. Uh, a case, so uh, we don't find their coherent motion. Uh, for, however, we find large scale coherency, the red curves for extensile dipoles, very uh, comparable to what we find in our experimental data. For the contractile case, you see that there we have a small, small non zero um, correlation length that corresponds actually to the size of the one uh, stoke slab. So that's kind of right. The, the, uh, every of those dipoles will have their very own uh, flow around it. So this is what it measures, but it does not actually increase with time. This shows you is that it is the extensile activity that is needed actually for generating coherent motion. Also perform the whole phase diagram by exploring if you need, uh, how, how many of such dipoles you need, uh, what their strength needs to be. And we found that in Indeed, there is, when you look at a film here, uh, where you have a probability of force dipole also to be active on x-axis, and here on the y-axis, the strength of those dipoles, you see that there is a, a nice smooth boundary between non-coherent and coherent um, behavior, where you can see with uh, many weak dipoles, you can achieve the same effect as with few very strong ones, but the activity has to be extensile. So we see that the hydrodynamic interactions alone from this uh, toy model uh, suggest, uh, so, so our model suggests that the hydrodynamic uh, interaction alone can actually uh, cause the extensile dipole, uh, dipolar forces to generate a coherent motion. So the, um, the implication of this shows us is that the genome kind of is, is uh, non-stop dynamics. It, we like to view it as self-stirred, and it has a major implication for the genome organization, and thus for gene regulations, constantly actually um, in motion and locally reorganizing. So to reconcile it with the detailed static picture that we have from high cement and still, of course, a uh, question since currently our resolutions are still still um, apart. Uh, this is kind of the direction. This is the million dollar questions where we are, well, many of us are heading. In the, for, for the remainder of my talk, I'd like to discuss uh, the uh, rheology of genome, so the material properties of uh, genome as such that we have um, explored. So traditionally here, the approach uh, was to inject um, particles, um, either non-magnetic or magnetic, and um, perform rheology measurements this way. Now, these type of techniques, however, um, can be invasive for them. So we were kind of looking for a non-invasive way to um, evaluate the rheology of the genome. And we found that like, well, we have their probes already present. If you look here, you see these two holes, which uh, are actually nucleoli, so these voids in the chromatin signal are, um, sub-nuclear bodies that are present in our nuclei, and the question, can we use them directly to probe the rheology of the genome? So first, just a brief uh, introduction of the nucleolus. Nucleolus is the largest structure uh, in of the cell nucleus. It has further its own structure, its internal structure. It is the of ribosomal biogenesis, so its biological role is uh, extremely important. 
um, how it acts with chromatin, um, it's important to answer, to know, before we use it a rheological probe, because if it's a solid particle, it will behave and interact differently as if, for example, if it will be a liquid droplet that actually um, deforms on its own or it, it has types of interactions with the surrounding chromatin. So this is exactly um, that we set out to answer is the nucleus in human cells here liquid like or solid like um, so you as you are most of you are familiar with so there were beautiful studies by uh, Brinkman's groups have shown in frog all sites that the nuclei there are indeed being as uh, liquid droplets uh, frog egg is a beautiful system with a couple thousand that are rather large and uh, so um, Cliff has observed here beautiful fusions of these uh, nucleoli. Moreover, they have also um, uh, proteins uh, uh, which, uh, make, which make the uh, nucleoli and found that you know, these proteins mixed with RNA actually tend to phase separate and form these droplets in vitro. Therefore, the frog nucleoli were formed by, were, were presumed to form by liquid liquid phase separate. Now, how the human nucleoli, however, behave uh, remained uh, still a question since the situation of the human nucleus is slightly different. Note the whole nucleus is actually smaller than one single frog nucleus, and the nucleoli that we see here here are at the order of ma one micron as opposed here to 20 and also as you see instead of a couple thousand we have two or three generally so how do you prove for this teeny tiny one micrometer structure itself that they are either liquid droplets or solid particles so this is we, what we here uh, set out to do. So first, we have observed and measured a high resolution the surface fluctuations of the nucleoli. And what we find here is the contour of the nucleolus here boxed in at different times. You see that the, the, uh, the shape fluctuates. This is how you can, you can visualize these, uh, these fluctuations, so the deviations from an average uh, contour. Um, we can, from this, estimate the surface tension by assuming should these, be, should these fluctuations be thermally driven and obtain an estimate of surface tension in the order of 10 to minus 6, which is actually in a very good agreement with both the frog but also with the polymer colloidal uh, solutions. So this is already a good uh, hint to think that indeed this nucleus will be liquid. Uh, but then the ultimate proof is by observing their fusion when they come together. This is, however, a difficult feat because as I told you, there is a number of nuclei in human cells. Um, they're tethered to DNA, so they're not so, uh, they're not so mobile. And the fusion process it says, says itself takes about 10 minutes, but the cell is at the order of uh, 35 hours. So you have to be kind of at the right place at the right time to. So for that, a very talented student in my group, Christina Karajin, went through 10 tunnels. Uh, she developed a semi-automatic uh, algorithm where she was able to scan through those cells, identify 150 of those that were in close proximity and uh, good candidates for fusion. Then she, she kept uh, 14 fusions in XY plane where we have the highest motion in order to resolve the information here about this neck or connecting to fusing globi. So what we do, right, the information uh, in this growing is very rich. It provides us basically exactly with the info which forces are participating in the fusion process. Um, and that uh, can, can teach you or can reveal what crossed here on the way. So you, we, you see here such experiment. We measure the, the, the net growing as shown in this, in this cartoon up here. And so here, this is the rich radius R, so this is what we are obtaining here in this in this graph. So what we do, we have obtained 14 of such fusions. Um, as I mentioned, we are here at uh, Reynolds number, so the viscous forces are highly dominating. Uh, in such case, consider it could be either the outer or inner fluid that actually is controlling the 
it's going to be um, coalescence when we rescale our our data here with respect to the size of the nuclei and to time scales we find that actually all the collapses on the power law of t to one half which shows you it's the outer fluid that's the nucleoplasm actually uh, controls or dra uh, resists the kinetics of the um, nuclear coalescence, which is very, very important. So it tells us it's the environment of the nuclei that controls how fast or how quickly they can fuse. Moreover, from this data, we can actually extract the ratio of the surface tension and viscosity, as shown here. Remember, we have already surface tension before, so now we can extract also the viscosity. So here, purely, um, purely from non-invasive measurements, we have obtained a uh, complete rheological character of both surface tension and um, viscosity um, of surface surrounding here, nucleolus. So the last uh, fact that I would like to mention is that it's important to note that the both surface and viscosity are effective quantities as we are working here actually with active fluid and um, we have applied here passive models. This is beautifully shown through the uh, following experiment where you see our control nuclei are round, but when you deplete ATP, the surface uh, tension even lower as it start, it, the, the nuclei lose their spherical shape. So we see that extension gamma is ATP dependent. We have even found a specific, specific process are responsible for these processes that you can find in uh, our paper here. So with that, just uh, briefly summarize. So what is this uh, good for? Um, we uh, feel the possible impact of this basically extremely slow coalescence of these new nuclei is important when you consider that there is a RDNA transcription happening inside of the nucleoli, uh, which the process of transcribing one piece of RDNA of its average size lasts about 100 seconds. In vitro uh, coalescence times happen at the three seconds, in vivo at the order of uh, 10 to 2 seconds. So if such a transcription process would be perturbed by very fast coalescence, it, um, it would uh, lead to perturbation of this, this uh, highly important process. However, if you bleed it very slowly, if the coalescence happens very slowly, this transcription inside of nucleoli can continue unperturbed. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, finish with the final conclusion that we believe that it's the long coalescence times that are needed for the, for the unter unperturbed transcription of our DNA. So for the, for the sake of time, I will here skip my conclusion and just uh, thank my team uh, who were all instrumental in, in this work. This is how our life used to look. This is how it uh, these days. Um, and uh, thank you everyone uh, for your attention. Hi there. Okay, let me see who uh, would like to ask questions. Uh, Peter, you're always sort of first on the draw here. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, uh, sorry about that, but um, uh, it's very, uh, very uh, exciting work. And uh, I, I, I may seem like a Johnny OneNote here, but um, you know, your picture of the extensile case in your simulation, uh, as you described, uh, becomes anisotropic. It's anisotropic, uh, you mentioned in the flows, but of course, when I look at the picture, it's also anisotropic in the orientations of the chromosomes. Yes, you start to have um, also nematic alignment of the chromatin fiber. Right, and which is of course a feature that, uh, as I mentioned, you know, occurs in uh, in in some of the inversions of the uh, uh, the, the high C data. So I'll ask the same question I did before: What happens when you look under cross polarizers? We have not done that for the system. So there's uh, experimentally, there are a couple of challenges, um, uh -huh. but I would anticipate that actually there won't be biofringence. So this you is- You don't think there's biofringence? I do, I do not anticipate actually biofringence. But your picture, probably. then then your model would be quite different from the situation so, so, one the thing right, so you have to consider the, the model is very simple, right? So as I say, we, it's a toy model. So it's, uh, uh, Basically, the main goal was to ask if hydrodynamics alone is uh, in shape to actually generate flows of uh, 
such scale, right? So with respect to the um, alignment, you have to think that the, the model is already largely coarse grained, right? So meaning that even a chain, it's such maybe we should not be imagining it as, a, as basically linear pieces of chain, right, parallelly aligned, but actually it's kind of a larger regions that are somehow stuck together. So, so that's what I mean. I do not anticipate that there might be- Yeah, there clearly can be ways to wipe out any anisotropy even in the binding of the dye, but, but I, I also think uh, there's a stuff that David Patoyan looked at um, in the, when we tried to simulate your stuff in a model, uh, which was the, uh, the sort of the velocity liquid crystallinity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that would be interesting, which you could do by just not labeling things so intensely and do some kind of super resolution to see how the actually measure the velocities yeah, more, more, more precisely, I think, uh, and see how they're correlated angularly. Right, so, so, so kind of to go lower to uh, more like single molecule level, right? Because, almost, yeah, yeah, almost. Right, right. Because only, I mean, the, preci yeah, yeah. the precision of measurements, right? So, so it's kind of what you're asking is more the spatial resolution with respect to the uh, tracer as opposed, right? Because the measurement of the velocity actually does not really change. It, its precision will be the same. It is just the the entities that uh, one yes. would check, right? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah, no, so, so, so that's uh, definitely, um, you know, so, so something that we, we, we could definitely explore. That's a good idea. Uh, TJ? Thank you. Thank you. TJ, are you there somewhere? Oh yeah, I see him. <laughs> are you, are you Oh, unmuted? you muted, you muted yes. TJ. Yes. <laughs> what happened to him? He, he unmuted and then muted himself again. Uh, well, okay, now I can speak. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. There's, a, there's a lag. Uh, so I have a question about the force vector. So you you actually speculated uh, in one of your slides that some enzymes such as silicases, remodeling enzymes, could be uh, responsible for the force vector. But um, I'm uh, I'm just curious as to whether. Is it, is it, it's actually feasible for these enzymes to uh, cause a uh, large enough scale movement uh, directionally to be seen in uh, microscopy experiments. Right? So, what so is the length scale uh, in terms of you know nanometers uh, yes. or maybe number yes. base pairs that you need to move to? So that's a that's a very good point yeah. because um, so. For, I'm not sure if I have mentioned that um, in the talk, um, the kind of average size of these motors is about five nanometers, right? But mm -hmm. the uh, coherent length, the, the length scale of the coherent motion is few micrometers. So of course, it's unlikely that one single guy, right, one single motor can actually drive those. So that was the, the, full, the hypothesis that we started with, that we likely need to have actually a group of these motors that uh, collaborate. Um, and then basically, you know, the, for example, helicases, they exhibit forces uh, or at the order of 35 piconewtons. So you could imagine depending um, how many, how far from each other and so on uh, there would be that you could locally, basically, if you, if you evaluate the, uh, basically the motion of the fluid around them and the hydrodynamic coupling, that what is the length scale that this could, uh, this, this could achieve. Of course, there would be many, many of them would have to, would have to uh, participate. The question is, if, um, you know, the participation can be somehow basically forced, this is what I meant by this force induced alignment, meaning you have a one force fluctuation, so to say, that gives you one direction and that kind of flips the motors, uh, the dipoles that are close by as dominoes and kind of uh, aligns them, right? because we also see that these uh, coherent domains actually live for several seconds and then suddenly they break up and a new ones form. So we um, speculate that that could be due to actually you have a local force fluctuations that is in a different uh, uh, direction, so in a new angle with respect to the original direction. And then that forces you basically to regroup and um, the group of motors actually go together in the new direction. Thank you. Thank okay, you. one last question from Yifeng Shing. Yifeng. 
Hi, Alexandra. Uh, thank okay. you for, for, the, for the talk. Um, so I'm just like wondering, uh, could you comment on uh, one thing, like, um, like why, uh, like when cell enter, like at the starting of the cell circle, uh, it started with like um, a, a very large number of nucleolus, um, like maybe on the order of tens, um, and then it, it started to like coalescence, and and at the very end, as you show, before it in your experiments, is it ended up with like two or three, um, like I just wonder, like, could you comment on why it ended up with two or only two or three, why, why it doesn't really coalescence into uh, a modern cluster. Like, uh, I, I assume like it, it might have some effect from chromosome, but but if that effect is applied, then why like, you know, at the starting of the cell circle, like uh, like smaller ones are sort of uh, able to merge. Is it because of like the, maybe like there was some balance between the surface tension and the chromosome effect or like, I just wonder, like, what, uh, could you comment on something? Thank you, thank you. Yeah, that, that's a beautiful question. So in human cells, you start with exactly 10 nucleoli. Their number is genetically given because they are allowed to form only around a very specific uh, genetic sequences. And you have exactly 10 of those sequences. So you start with 10 of those. And then as the cell cycle progresses, actually already quite early after mitosis, uh, um, a lot of them, well, majority of them actually comes together and they start to coalesce and uh, build the, the larger one. Now, interestingly, everyone, every nucleus, always as they are coming, they're bringing with, with themselves the DNA that they're on, right? Mm -hmm. So that actually limits their mobility quite a bit. Now, this is in a huge contrast mm -hmm. to when you think about the experiments from frog egg, when you see 2000 nucleoli, those are actually, so, so the egg has a completely different process. Uh, it uh, operates on so-called uh, amplified RDNAs, where actually these sequences around which uh, nuclei are allowed to form are actually uh, copied first. You, you prepare uh, 2000 about at the order of 2,000 copies uh, of only that sequence, and you form three nucleoli that are now allowed to freely move through the through the large frog uh, nucleus. So that's why the situation in somatic cells is very different. So what we believe, so now imagine in human cells, when you start with 10, then these guys have to come together. And what we observe is that there is this sweet spot, everyone ends at two or three, of large nucleoli. Sometimes we see one gigantic nucleus, but mostly you see two to three. So we do not know the reason for that, but what we believe is following that actually, you know, in order as the nuclei are getting bigger and bigger, you have to, and the nucleus is filled with, with chromatin and other stuff. So in order for them actually to come closer, other stuff has to reshuffle, plus they're coming with their own chromatin, right? So it's not so simple actually to get closer together as they become larger and larger. So this is a very interesting question that we're actually looking into. Um, how is also the, the uh, reorganization of the chromatin connected or correlated with the motion nu of nucleoli and, and so on? So actually, Christina Karajin from my group will be giving a, a talk in the session uh, in um, an hour or so. So I think that she will show you even more details uh, about that story. Thank you. I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Okay, uh, now for the rest of the afternoon, we have four shorter talks. The first talk is being given by Akush Basu from uh, Johns Hopkins, measuring DNA mechanics on the genome scale. So firstly, thank you to the organizers for giving me a slot to present my work. My name is Akash Basu and I'm a postdoc in Tekchi Paz lab at Johns Hopkins University. And I'll talk to you about my work related to measuring how the mechanical properties of DNA vary with sequence. So um, bent DNA conformations occur ubiquitously in biology and shown here are three diverse examples, the bacterial DNA gyrase which bends DNA, the nucleosomes and transcription factors which also induce uh, DNA looping. And because bent DNA is so ubiquitous, it leads us to asking the question whether the mechanical properties of DNA can influence the formation, the remodeling, and the dissolution of such nucleoprotein complexes. 
So to answer if there is such a global mechanical basis for modulation, we need to measure how the mechanical properties of DNA vary as a function of position along the genome. Now there are many low throughput methods to measure how DNA sequence um, influences its mechanical properties. And I'm showing one method, which is of particular importance in my work, involves observing the cyclization of short DNA fragments. So here is a DNA sequence of interest decorated at either end by uh, 10 base pair uh, sticky complementary overhangs and fret pairs. We can observe the looping of this molecule by observing fret as a function of time, and the looping rate has presumably, presumably is a measure of the bendability of this DNA fragment. Now on the right here are the looping kinetic curves of seven different DNA sequences. And we find that depending on sequence, the looping rate can vary by more than an order of magnitude. So it implies that on these short 100 base pair length scales, DNA looping is profoundly influenced by the local uh, sequence of DNA itself. How then do we take this sensitive measurement to a high throughput scale so that we can use it for genome-wide studies? So to do that, we develop this technique called LoopSeq, where we start with not just one sequence of DNA, but a library containing as many as 90,000 different sequences of DNA molecules and multiple copies of each sequence. We chemically modify every molecule so that they have sticky overhangs, immobilize the molecules onto a surface, and loop the molecules for one minute in presence of high salt. Now, presumably, the most flexible molecules will loop whereas the molecules that are rigid will remain unlooped. These unlooped molecules after a minute of looping are removed by the action of an exonuclease, RecBCD, which preserves these looped molecules. Finally, the surviving molecules are sequenced and the original library is also sequenced. And the intrinsic cyclizability of a sequence in the library is defined as the ratio of its relative population in this surviving pool to that in the original pool itself. So in other words, it is a measure of the probability of a certain sequence to survive this process of looping and selection, which in turn is presumably related to the sequence's uh, bendability or flexibility. So having developed a high throughput method to measure the mechanical properties of DNA, we applied it to various interesting regions of the genome. So shown here is a typical region surrounding the transcription start site of an yeast gene. There are two important features here. Downstream of the transcription start site is a well-ordered array of nucleosomes, uh, denoted as plus one, plus two, plus three, and so on, whereas just upstream is a nucleosome depleted region, or NDR. The first question we asked is, do the sequence encoded mechanical properties of DNA in this NDR in any way contribute to nucleosome depletion here? So to answer that question, using LoopSeq, we scanned, we measured and scanned how intrinsic cyclizability varies as a function of position as you go along the genes of 500 different genes in East straddling this region around the transcription start site. And this is what we found. So in the bottom panel, uh, the x-axis is distance from the dyad that is the center of the plus one nucleosome. And in the y-axis in the bottom panel is nucleosome occupancy measured completely independently by a different group, by, by Hennikoff's group uh, a few years ago. What we find, these peaks show the ordered array of downstream nucleosomes, whereas this dip here shows the nucleosome depleted region. In the top panel is the corresponding map of intrinsic cyclizability of DNA that we have measured averaged across these 500 randomly selected genes. And we find that the nucleosome depleted region is also marked by a well-defined narrow region of extremely rigid DNA. Therefore, we, one of the conclusions that we can draw is that the rigidity of DNA here contributes to nucleosome depletion presumably because nucleosome formation involves extensive DNA binding. But what about the ordered array of nucleosomes that lie downstream of the transcription start site? Various models have been proposed to uh, understand how this ordered array is generated. And one such model is that is the stacking of nucleosomes against some kind of a barrier near the five prime ends of genes past which nucleosome remodelers are unable to translocate nucleosomes. 
But what could constitute such a barrier has been a matter of debate, and transcription factors, among other things, have been widely implicated. But there is one nucleosome remodeler, INO80, which is rather special because even in the complete absence of transcription factors or any other factors, it is still able to position the plus one nucleosome at its canonical location. So we asked, what is this sequence encoded region of rigid DNA that we discovered to lie near the five prime ends of genes able to serve as a barrier against which INO80 can stack and position the plus one nucleosome? To answer that question, I want to uh, point out two observations about INO80. The first is that before INO80 can slide a nucleosome like this into a free DNA nucleus, in, into a free DNA linker region, the length of this linker region must at least be 40 base pairs long. And presumably the reason for that is that INO80 has an ARP module that reaches out and grabs DNA that lies 40 base pairs ahead of the edge of the nucleosome that it is sliding. The second observation is that this region of rigid DNA that we discovered co-centric with the nucleosome depleted region also starts precisely 40 base pairs upstream of the edge of the plus one nucleosome. So it strongly suggests that this rigid DNA region is precisely positioned to serve as a barrier against further upstream sliding of the plus one nucleosome by INO80. But of course, a stronger claim can be made if we can directly show that rigid DNA hinders um, INO80 sliding. So to do that, we created these two nucleosome constructs involving a nucleosome and an 80 base pair of linker DNA region. The sequences of these linker DNAs were different. In one case, the DNA was rigid, and in the other case, the DNA was flexible. As INO80 acts, it results in the centering of these nucleosomes, and centered nucleosomes show up as a band in a gel which runs slower than the original nucleosomes. Now for various such pairs of rigid DNA, um, rigid and flexible linkers, we quantified the extent of sliding and we consistently found that there is more sliding when this linker DNA is more flexible. So all this suggests a model in which this region of rigid DNA, which is sequence encoded, serves as a barrier against which INO80 presumably can stack the plus one nucleosomes whereas other nucleosomes downstream can then be evenly spaced out with respect to the plus one nucleosome. Now let us shift gears for a moment and talk not just about those nucleosomes that are near the transcription start sites, but nucleosomes in general. Now, the mechanical properties of DNA have never been measured in high throughput directly across, uh, across nucleosomes. To achieve that, we mapped how intrinsic cyclizability varies as a function of position along the entire length of East chromosome 5. There are about 3,000 nucleosomes known to lie along East chromosome 5, and plotted here is the average intrinsic cyclizability profile across these nucleosomes. And we find that, nucleus, that, that, that um, near the dyad of the, that is the center of nucleosomes, DNA is significantly more flexible than near the edges of these nucleosomes. Now, it becomes more interesting when we sort these nucleosomes according to their distance from the transcription start site. We find that this contrasted intrinsic cyclizability between the dyad and the edges of nucleosomes increases for nucleosomes that lie deeper in the gene body than for nucleosomes that are more proximal to the promoter. Now, this is how we understand it. Presumably, these promoter proximal nucleosomes are primarily organized by the stacking action of remodelers against this five prime barrier. Now, this stacking effect has been shown to dissipate beyond the plus four nucleosomes, which is right about where our data suggests that this contrast in intrinsic cyclizability starts to become more and more prominent. And therefore, we feel that the sequence encoded um, modulations in cyclizability may have taken over the job of positioning nucleosomes in regions that are deep into the gene body and therefore far from the influence of statistical positioning by the stacking of nucleosomes against the five prime barrier. The last question we asked is would this strong modulation in intrinsic cyclizability be preserved if we now randomize the sequences of these nucleosomes while still preserving the amino acid sequence of the gene? And the short answer is no. 
So this modulation in intrinsic cyclizability that we see for native sequences is completely gone if you randomize the sequences while still preserving the amino acid sequence. It suggests that codon choice in CERB-CA has been fine-tuned to create a mechanical pattern along genes that is most conducive to the organization of deeper gene body nucleosomes. And the broader claim, of course, is that the evolution of codon choice has been impacted by the manner in which sequence modulates mechanics. So in conclusion, we experimentally show that DNA sequence globally modulates DNA mechanics and that this effect has influences various things, such as the organization of nucleosomes from promoters, from the NDR to deep within gene bodies, the activities of remodelers, and the evolution of codon choice. And this last point particularly suggests that intrinsic cyclizability is functionally important and therefore must have put a selective pressure while, uh, during the evolutionary history of genomes. I wish to thank my postdoc mentor, TJ, and all members of the HA lab shown here in quarantine, uh, with a specific mention to several people, such as Tunch, Matt, Dimitri, uh, Basilio, Ashley, and Tui, who have all contributed in various capacities. I also want to thank uh, Carl Wu, Carl Peter Hoffner, Anand, and Sebastian for, their, for providing INO80 and for their help related to the INO80 experiments, and also to Cynthia Wolberger and Jun Song's lab, and uh, Mike Morgan and Thomas and Miroslav for helping with various aspects of the assay. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much for that interesting talk. Do we have any questions? We have a question from uh, Megan, Megan King. Hi, I was uh, curious whether you think there's any role also for non-B DNA and whether there's overlap with what you see and what has been determined by things like sorrel and cross-linking. Um, that's true. We have not uh, we have not explored that question, but it's definitely a very interesting question to ask whether uh, the role of sequence-dependent uh, DNA mechanics and how that would uh, translate uh, in the in the case of non non BDNA, um, but um, yeah, the short answer is we have not looked and in, looked into it, and and it would be and it would be very interesting to to learn more about it because those structures do occur in various relevant regions of the chromosome, and DNA mechanics as the model that we're going for is that DNA mechanics is globally important, and so you know, its influence on these structures would definitely be functionally relevant to ask. Okay, we have another question from Seychelle Voss. Hi, Akash, beautiful talk. Oh, thanks. Um, so I was wondering about the NDR region. Um, in humans and yeast, this region is pretty highly contested, um, if there's a nucleosome there or not. Right. And I was wondering if your data could go anywhere to say in the human situation, if you'll have a similar kind of thing happening or not with um, cyclization, that kind of thing. Yeah, so am I allowed to share screen? Um, I, guess I don't I, know. All right, I, I have a feeling I am. Yes, you can, you should be able to. Yes. So, uh, so if you look here, so yeah, I mean, we, we don't know what sits at the, what sits at the NDR, uh, whether it's a nucleosome, whether it's something else. Your question was about the NDR, right? Or the minus one session? No, no, the NDR. The NDR, right. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so the, the sharing was not really necessary. Um, yeah, no, no. In general, we know that the NDR is very rigid. So what, we're not saying that, that, you know, nothing sits there. Just something that sits there is probably not something that would extensively bend DNA, right? And now to, uh, to make another point about it, uh, you know, certain nucleosomes, certain minus one nucleosomes have been um, uh, thought to be fragile minus one nucleosomes. And equivalently, it has also been contended that those are not nucleosomes with something else, right? So we found that whatever it is, whether it's a nucleosome or whether it's something else, that those genes that have fragile minus one nucleosomes or this something else are also genes that in general have more rigid DNA in the location of the minus one nucleosome. So the same answer could be translated in the case of the NDR by saying that 
it, we don't know if it's a nucleosome there or not, but whatever it is, it better not bend DNA too much. Awesome, thanks. Okay, can we? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, any last minute questions before we move on? Oh, one more question. Last question from Sterno. Sterno, are you there? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask you, did you measure the bendability which, uh, did you see if there are correlation between the bendability you measure and thermodynamic stability of the DNA measured by nearest neighbor interactions? So, so we, we did that in a very, um, uh, okay, this is the only capacity in which you do it. So the thermodynamic stability has a lot to do with the AT content in general. Uh, we observe no such direct correlation between overall AT or GC content and the bendability of DNA. However, we have not gone into more detailed analysis that involves nearest neighbor interactions to clarify if there is such a correlation or not. But that's definitely part of the ongoing work in which we are also looking at uh, understanding how sequence features influence our bendability measurements itself. Thanks, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for the talk. Uh, let's move on to the next talk by Lucas Farning from the Max Planck and Göttingen. Uh, CHD chromatin remodelers influence local chromatin organization. It's really great to be here and I'm very much looking forward to sharing my current research with you. And today I will be presenting my work on the CHD family of chromatin remodelers and how they can influence local chromatin organization at the level of individual nucleosomes. Um, but before I go into the nitty gritty details, I just want to point out how fascinating it is that a single cell can develop into a full grown organism. And of course, this requires intricate regulation of gene expression at all levels of the central dogma. And I'm especially interested in the first step of the central dogma, where RNA polymerases transcribe the genomic information into RNA molecules. And while the central dogma is very beautiful, of course, in its simplicity, the devil is always in the details. So uh, when we just consider the DNA, this becomes quite apparent. Eukaryotic DNA in the nucleus has to play quite conflicted roles. On one hand, eukaryotic cells need to accommodate the large genomes in the tight confines of the nucleus to protect it from detrimental effects. So compaction is required. But at the same time, the organism, of course, also needs to access its genetic information to replicate its genome, to transcribe RNA, and if it occurs, also repair DNA damage. So these processes all require access to DNA. So this is quite a dramatic logistical problem. So the big question is, how are these interests of compaction and accessibility realized in eukaryotes? And luckily, evolution has come up with this ingenious proteinucleic acid complex that we probably all love called chromatin that allows both for compaction as well as controlled accessibility. And this becomes quite evident in this electron micrograph of this interface nucleus, where we see regions with high levels of compaction, which we typically call heterochromatin, and then regions of a lower local concentration of chromatin that we call euchromatin. Um, but of course, this is a very um, mesoscale view. Um, I think it's important to stress that the fundamental nuclear processes, such as DNA repair, transcription, or DNA replication, um, are all happening at nanometer scales, where um, they're not facing these big chunks of chromatin, but rather the fundamental unit of, um, of chromatin, which is, of course, the nucleosome. Um, the nucleosome itself consists of a protein component, um, the histone proteins, and 145 to 247 base pairs of DNA that are wrapped around the histone octamer. And these extensive contacts between the histones and the DNA make it very difficult to move the nucleosome on the uh, DNA substrate. So they provide a formidable barrier. And the cell then employs, or even has to employ, molecular motors, so-called chromatin remodelers, to modulate the nucleosome landscape. 
And generally, the activity of chromatin remodelers is subdivided into three distinct categories. First, nucleosome assembly and spacing. Second, chromatin access, which is very important at gene promoters to recruit uh, the transcription machinery. And then also um, histone exchange, which is relevant in DNA repair when certain um, histone isoforms are exchanged for others. And we can then use these different activities as well as the subunit and domain composition to subdivide the remodelers into four subfamilies, which are known as iSwitch, CHD, SwitchSniff, and the Eno80 family. But despite the differences, all of these chromatin remodelers are molecular motors, ATPases, that can translocate along DNA. And this involves two lobes. Both of these lobes track along the same strand of DNA, where one lobe sits slightly ahead of the other. And upon ATP hydrolysis, these motors can then move and facilitate translocation of the DNA. But the chromatin remodelers have not only these two domains, these reg a like lobes, but they also carry additional regulatory domains or form even multi subunit complexes to move the nucleosomal barrier. So I specifically want to understand at a mechanistic level how these chromatin remodelers work. And the most approachable target at the time was the CHD family of remodelers because most of its members are signal subunit chromatin remodelers. And in the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, there is actually only one member, CHD1. And CHD1 has this very modular domain architecture with a centrally located ATP base motor around which regulatory domains are arranged. Um, and there is namely a double chromo domain at the end terminus and a DNA binding region that is uh, consisting of a sand and a slide domain on the C terminus. So CHD1 is really an ideal model system to study chromatin um, uh, remodeling. Specifically, I wanted to understand how CHD1 engages the nucleosome, what functions the regulatory domains have, and also learn about the mechanism of DNA translocation. And for this purpose, I was able to form a complex between the nucleosome and CHD1, and then collected a cryo-EM data set with approximately 4,000 micrographs, and particle picking then revealed approximately 1, mil 1 million particles. Subsequent to declassification then revealed a nucleosome-like structure with additional, additional density for CHD1, and I then obtained a reconstruction of this complex at a nominal resolution of 4.6 angstrom. And um, using already existing crystal structures as well as de novo modeling, I was able to obtain the final structure that you see here rotating right now. Where you can see that CHD1 interacts quite extensively with DNA on one side of the nucleosome. Specifically, CHD1 binds with its ATPase motor at superhelical location plus two, while the double chromo domain binds closer to the diet at superhelical location plus one via a basic patch interaction with the backbone of the DNA. And additionally, we also observe this um, quite dramatic unraveling of two full helical turns um, of DNA, which is stabilized by the DNA binding region. And to visualize this, we have modeled here a canonical nucleosome with extra nucleosomal DNA, and the, we then morph to our structure. And I think you can appreciate the dramatic change the DNA undergoes quite easily. In fact, the DNA changes its trajectory by approximately 60 degrees. And this seems to be really a signature rearrangement of CHD1. And one can then speculate that this rearrangement probably destabilizes the nucleosome to allow for high efficiency once the tightly regulated process of remodeling takes place. Which brings me to the next topic called regulation. One of the big questions really is, is how the ATPase motor is able to recognize its nucleosomal substrate so it doesn't just act on naked linear DNA. And to understand this question, a 10-year-old crystal structure from the Bowman lab um, from Johns Hopkins University helped us tremendously to understand the regulation of CHG1. This crystal structure captured the ATPase motor with the double chromo domain in an inhibited state where the chromo domain sequesters lobe 2. And we have modeled this state here onto our structure. And I can now show that upon binding of CHD1 to the nucleosome, the double chromo domain interacts with superhelical location plus 1 and recognizes the nucleosomal DNA. And this swinging of the double chromo domain really relieves the basic patch on ATPA slope 2. And the ATPA slope can then close and bind ATP and actively engage the nucleosome at superhelical location plus 2 to start its remodeling activity. But regulation does not only happen intramolecularly, but also intermolecularly. 
And as an additional regulatory mechanism to control nucleosome recognition, we were able to observe interactions of the H4 tail with ATPA slope 2. And this is shown here in this bright green color for the H4 tail. And this finding is especially important because acetylation of H4K16 is one of the most important hallmarks of euchromatin, and one can even speculate that acetylation of H4K16 probably also has a direct impact on the activity of the CHD chromatin remodel. So together with the great amount of biochemical work, as well as the structural data that we provide now, I think we can now visualize the workings of this particular ATPase motor where ratcheting seems to explain the translocation movement, which ultimately provides the basis for chromatin remodel. So first, the ATPase binds DNA in a partially closed conformation that is shown here, and we call this the pre-translocated state. ATP binding then leads to complete closure of the motor and movement of lobe two, and this is called the post-translocated state. And this also triggers the DNA translocation by discrete one base per steps. ATP hydrolysis then dissociates ADP and resets the ATPase, and we're back to the pre-translocated state. And the enzymatic cycle can then begin again. And this is again summarized in this movie now, where we are first in the pre-translocated state, we bind ATP, close, go to the post-translocated state, hydrolyze ATP, reset of the motor, and another enzymatic cycle can begin as we see here. So taking everything together, the nucleosome CHD1 complex provides a pretty good framework for understanding chromatin remodeling. Upon nucleosome binding, the double chromo domain releases the ATP slope through the swinging motion that I showed earlier, and then cycles of ATP hydrolysis lead to a movement of the ATP motor in one direction while shifting DNA towards the diet. And this then ultimately pulls DNA in from the opposite side and makes the DNA longer on the proximal side where CHD1 binds, ultimately resulting in chromatin remodeling when we go through many enzymatic cycles. But whereas the CHD family has only one member in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it has undergone a dramatic expansion in humans where this family has a total of nine members. And these nine members are categorized in three subfamilies and they were able to acquire or exchange certain domains. So I wanted to understand how evolution of one member is specifically CHD4 from subfamily two influenced its activity. And CHD4 is especially interesting because it is implicated in heterochromatin formation and maintenance, as well as a member of multi-subunit complexes. So this is significantly different from CHD1, which is a single subunit chromatin remodeler and is mostly a transcription initiation and elongation factor. So, using again cryo-EM, I was able to obtain the structure of a single copy um, of CHD4 bound to a nucleosome as well as two copies at um, a resolution of 3.1 and 4 angstrom. And the single copy of CHD4 bound to the nucleosome core particles to date the highest resolution structure of any chromatin remodeler NCP complex. And it shows, compared to CHD1, overall a very conserved architecture. The most, difference, uh, the most striking difference, however, was that CHD4 is not able to unravel nucleosomal DNA, as you can see here, um, which is consistent, of course, with its role in heterochromatin maintenance, where this is probably not favorable. But in my experimental setup, there was a minor inconsistency because I had used AMP, PNP for CHD4 and ADP beryllium fluoride for CHD1. So to test if this also as an influence on the level of unraveling, I established a FRET assay to monitor this process to really verify if CHD4 is responsible for the difference in the DNA trajectory or if it is rather due to the ATP analog. And this FRET assay employs two FRET probes on either side of the nucleosome, and we can then excite the donor and measure the emission from both the donor and the acceptor probe. And this is shown here for the nucleosome core particle. We would then expect an increase in the donor emission and a decrease in the acceptor emission when CHD1 is bound, because the distances between the probes will increase. And indeed, this is the case for both ADP beryllium fluoride as well as for AMP PNP. When we now conduct the same experiment for CHD4, we see that the emission spectra do not change when compared to the nucleosomal control, giving clear evidence that CHD4 does not unravel the nucleosome as we had observed or as we had also observed in our structure. And overall, this is then also consistent with the roles of these different CHD chromatin remodelers, 
where CHG1 acts as a transcription initiation and elongation factor that acts in euchromatin, whereas CHG4, which is implicated in heterochromatin maintenance, does not unravel, um, which of course would also be quite unfavorable in a heterochromatin context. So integrated structural biology can be utilized to understand mechanisms of cell development and cell fate decisions at a near atomic level. And I think our understanding of chromatin remodeling is a prime example for this and shows how different domain architecture in the case of the CHD family of chromatin remodelers can influence the modulation of the nucleosomal landscape. I also want to quickly use the occasion to announce that my own lab will open in January 2021 at Harvard Medical School in the Department of Cell Biology, and that I'm looking for a motivated postdocs that want to work at the intersection of transcription and uh, chromatin. I want to also quickly acknowledge my funding sources and my collaborators in Göttingen. I want to especially thank my supervisor, Patrick Kramer, and my close collaborator on a number of projects, Seychelles, and I want to thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you. Um, first question, let's, let's, uh, let's see. Uh, TJ, you had a question. Hello, uh, I have a question about uh, the translocation mechanism. It wasn't clear from your movie uh, whether, uh, it, whether we know uh, with pretty good confidence that the step size is one base pair, two base pair, or non-integer size, or uh, also whether uh, we, ah, I need to stop my video, okay. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, my question is that, when, based on your data, I also data available in the literature, because there are many other structures now uh, of similar proteins, uh, do we know any more about the step size and also whether um, translocation actually involves rotation or motion of the motor around the DNA following the helical tract? Yeah, so based on um, what we have published now, as well as um, data from the Chen lab, as well as biochemical data from, from the Bowman lab, seems to indicate that um, the translocation, so one ATP hydrolysis event, is kind of coupled to one um, basically movement of the base pair in a single discrete step. Um, however, if this mean this does not necessarily mean that this propagates around the nucleosome in discrete steps. There's also data, I think, from uh, Sebastian Dindel, for example, that clearly shows that there is actually also larger step size sizes that can happen after these single translocation events can happen. So I think it will be really exciting in the future to maybe be able to really solve a number of structures of these chromatin remodelers on the nucleosome to actually see how this uh, changes uh, the DNA. Um, yeah, so we think basically by based on the movement of the ATPase um, that these are single one base pair steps that we're seeing that are discrete. And you think that is following the helical track? So we think it's, it's probably going to stay at the same position and that basically this movement back to the post translocated from the post translocated state to the pre translocated state will to some degree um, require that the lobe two will loosen its grip on uh, the DNA. And this would allow uh, the ATPS motor to stay at the same spot. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Dave Turnway, a question? Uh, it was very, very nice talk. I want to ask you if you know how persistent this motor is and, and, um, um, and does it matter for re re remodeling? So um, we think it's not um, very processive. So it's expected that it is doing a number of translocation cycles, but after that falls off and then the same molecule or a different one would engage again. Well, what's a number? A number means 10, 20, I'm a, do you know? So we, we assume it's like somewhere in the order between one and 10 um, discrete steps. I see. And, and you, you, you suggested that this is much more like a Brownian ratchet as opposed to some, anything involving a power stroke. 
And how did you determine that? I probably missed those arguments. Yeah, so the, the, um, the Chen lab um, from Tsinghua University published um, structures of the SNF2 chromatin remodeler um, mm -hmm. in an ATP bound state, as well as in an um, APO state, as well as in an ADP bound state. And from this, when we overlay this onto our structures, uh, we can basically determine by how much um, the chromatin remodeler and specifically lobe two moves. And this is what I tried to show in this, uh, in this movie, essentially. So it seems to be that it more acts like a Brownian regression. Yes, I would go along with, with this interpretation based on the available structural data that we have currently. Thanks. Uh, last question from uh, Ryan Cheng. Hi, um, very nice talk. So what determines the um, specificity of this remodeler to particular regions of chromatin? Like what, what determines that it basically binds to a certain region and it begins to sort of ratchet? Right, so um, there are, I think, first protein-protein interactions that can help with this. For example, CHT1 um, interacts with transcription elongation factors, such as the PATH complex, um, as well as FACT. So this could already determine, to some degree, where it gets recruited to. Additionally, um, CHT1 especially has a DNA binding region that could also influence where, it's, where it binds. And um, I'm citing Greg Bowman here again, has also shown that um, CHD, uh, CHD1 also has a propensity to, for example, stop at poly-TA um, rich stretches. So these could all go together to recruit these. Um, to some degree, the CHD family of chromatin remodelers um, is not as specific as, for example, the ENO80 family because um, not all of them have, for example, a um, more distinct DNA binding region that where one could really determine where this remodeler binds. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for the talk. Move on to the next talk in the session by Hao Yan from Yale, Dynamics of Loop Extruding Polymers. Okay, so I'm Hao from Yale University, and today I will talk about uh, dynamics of loop extruding polymers. Um, so in eukaryotic cells, DNA is packaged into a complex macromolecular structure called the chromatin. Um, it compacts the DNA, allowing it to fit into the small size of a cell nucleus. Um, the spatial organization and the folding of chromatin within the nucleus can determine the genome functions. Uh, for example, it controls the accessibility of DNA to cellular machinery for transcription regulation, repair, and recombination. Also, chromatin organization is closely related to its dynamics. It is found that a spatial organization called the topologically associating domain is a fundamental structure of chromatin. Uh, each chromosome occupies a territory within the interface nucleus, and they can be further divided into topological domains. Uh, these domains are classified on the basis of the DNA interaction frequencies. So within the domain, the regions frequently interact with themselves. However, the regions in different domains uh, have much lower interaction frequencies. And such type structure has been found in a wide range of organisms. To answer the question, how tests arise, um, the loop extrusion factor model provides an explanation. So SMC, SMC complexes include a family of proteins such as cohesin and condensin. Uh, in this model, they can be simplified as a pair of uh, connected loop extruding factors. So after they bind to the DNA, they can translocate along the DNA to extrude loops until they are stopped by boundary elements such as CTCFs. Um, therefore, an SMC can bring a pair of distant loci to be close and make contacts. So a loop can also disappear when the SMC falls off stochastically. So these are the basic assumptions of this model. Uh, because the model assumes loop extrusion by SMC requires uh, ATP, an attractive possibility is that um, SMC activity underlies ATP-dependent chromatin motion. Uh, 
So loss of SMC function is expected to dampen chromatin dynamics. Collaborating with the biology group, uh, we developed a live cell imaging and a tracking approach to characterize the spatial and temporal dynamics of chromatin loci. Through the mean square displacement analysis, uh, we observed a subdiffusive behavior in fishing yeast. However, when we disable when we disable SMC function by employing temperature sensitive mutations of the SMC loading factors, the MSDs are not lowered. Instead, they are elevated and the diffusion co coefficients have profound increases. So this finding is surprising given the assumptions of the existing LEF model. And this is observed in different loci, for example, uh, MMF1, PFL5, and many others. So these observations suggest that SMCs actually constrain the chromatin motion and they are not required for ATP-dependent chromatin mobility. In order to study how loop extrusion influences chromatin dynamics, we coupled the loop extrusion outputs to ROS model simulations. So ROS model is known as a simple polymer model in dilute solution uh, it also successfully describes the property of short chain melts. In the ROS model, the polymer is divided into beads that are connected with uh, imaginary springs. Each bead experiences a, a frictional force equal to the product of the bead's velocity and uh, the friction coefficient. Also, the entire chain is submerged in a fluid so that it experiences a random force in the environment as well. So here is the equation of motion, which is uh, straightforward. And compared to other terms, the initial term is uh, often negligible. So non-local interactions that are distant from the backbone of the chain are neglected in the ROS model. For example, there are no volume excluded interactions and no hydrodynamic interactions. So here we apply a normal mode analysis to solve the homogeneous equation. And for convenience, we use the matrix expression to represent a set of coupled linear differential equations. Uh, we expect the solutions involve exponential terms of time. So this becomes an eigenvalue problem. By matrix diagonalization, we derive the eigenvalues. Uh, its physical meaning is the inverse of the relaxation time of the polymer system. So usually, ROS model is used to describe short time behavior of polymer. So the time scale of ROS regime is usually below the largest relaxation time. Uh, we then move forward to take the stochastic process into consideration. So the normal modes follow a continuous Markov process with non-relaxation time and uh, diffusion constant. Uh, in order to simulate the normal modes, we observe that as long as the initial position is none, the normal mode at a later time, RDT, is just a linear combination of R0 and the Gaussian white noise. So the normal modes at any later time are supposed to be Gaussian. Uh, using this property, we just need to calculate the mean and the variance of the Gaussian for normal modes so that we can derive an update equation. Um, the various term here can be obtained by using the equipartition theorem. After that, we convert the coordinates back to the real space. So this method enables us to simulate exact polymer precisions without any approximation. Also, the time interval dt can be arbitrary, so it makes it possible for us to incorporate the time series from the loop extrusion into this polymer simulation. To introduce loops into the ROS model chain, the loops are modeled as additional harmonic bounds between two beads at left basis. So the dynamic matrix kappa A is replaced by kappa A plus L. Um, if beads I and J are connected by an SMC, the far from diagonal terms appear as an additional spring. So we solve for the eigenvalues and eigenmodes numerically. And here is an example. Uh, in this example, 
we compare the eigenvalues of looped and the unlooped polymers. So the red curve is for an unlooped Rolls chain with 600 beats. The eigenvalues follow the expression we derived earlier. Then we add 30 laps into the system and take several random loop configurations. Uh, interestingly, the, the last 30 eigenvalues increase significantly. And these correspond to 30 highest frequency components. However, we also find that different loop configurations actually make little difference. Uh, we plot the eigenvalues for different loop configurations in colored lines, and they almost overlap with each other. So the video here shows the evolution of loops on the polymer. Uh, on the right side, only one pair of left is labeled. It experiences extrusion, uh, stalling, dissociation, and rebinding. On the right side, all 30 loops are labeled. Uh, next, we explore the chromatin dynamics by mean square displacement. We perform the simulations in two different organisms, fishing yeast and mouse. So the time scale of the polymer and the bead sizes are different. Uh, in the ROS regime, the MSD for unlooped polymer chain has a time dependence of t to the one half. So the MSDs are plotted with the red lines in the figures. Uh, then we perform the simulations with loops. Apparently, the average the MSDs for looped polymers are lowered in both fishing yeast and the mouse. So these insets show the snapshots of the polymer in the simulations. The polymers with loops have a smaller radius of gyration. Uh, we then use a moving window to calculate the effective exponent alpha of the MSDs. Uh, as expected, the effective alpha without loop is close to one half over two decades of time. In contrast, the effective alpha with loops decline to smaller values and this result is highly consistent with the experiment. So in the experiment, the MSDs in fishing yeast have a time dependence of 0.44, which is smaller than an ideal ROS polymer. So to sum up, our simulation results confirm the fact that the existence of, loop, uh, the existence of loops constrains chromatin mobility. To have a better understanding how loops affect MSDs, uh, we perform the simulations with static loops as well. So we randomly take several loop configurations and we, uh, we put them into the ROS polymer simulations and keep them unchanged. We monitor the MSDs of beads at different locations. For reference, the red curve is the ideal ROS chain without any loop, and the blue curve is the average MSD with loops. So first we find that the MSDs of the beads in the middle of the backbone and in the middle of the loops are very similar. They are plotted as the black lines. So the overlap with the red MSD for short times, but at the longer times, they deviate and become lower than the red MSD. So next, we also check the beads close to the left feet. So the yellow curves represent their MSDs. Interestingly, uh, these MSDs are much lower than the other MSDs at all times. And these trends are clearly demonstrated by the effective alpha as well. So through the study of static loops, we conclude that loops have a larger effect on the motion of the beads close to the left feet. In other words, loops put an additional constraint to the nearby regions. Um, lastly, we also investigate how the number of lefts uh, influence polymer mobility. We input different numbers of lefts into the system. We find that the MSDs generally decrease as more lefts are introduced. So this is because more lefts can extrude more portions of the chromatin into loops. We also compare the MSDs for dynamic and the static loops. On average, the MSDs with dynamic loops are higher than the MSDs with static loops. So this is because the loop extrusion activity can add more mobility to the chromatin. And this is also in agreement with the experiments. So to sum up, our findings imply that uh, left catalyzed loops uh, largely reduce chromatin mobility. 
So in the left model, SMC activity is more likely ATP independent. So the loop extrusion activity requires other components to be the molder. For example, a nucleus thumb remodeler or RNA polymerase. And our simulation results are consistent with the experiments. So um, this work is in collaboration with people in biology and other groups. Uh, I want to express my thanks to everyone who contributed in this project. And I also appreciate the support from the funding source. Okay, thanks. Jose, go ahead. Can you clarify what you call as being a left? You said the SMC proteins are not left. How can we distinguish that at this, at this level? I'm still a little bit confused when you say you reconcile with experiments, basically. I understand some are independent, some are not, but how do I clear up that from the experiments? Uh, so in, uh, in the existing LAF model, uh, the, uh, the LAF is just the SMC, but uh, if, if SMC, um, if SMC is not ATP dependent, then it requires some other components. So it can be some composite right. left. But SMC may be, not SMC, but the motor coupled to the entire cohesion may be. So, so how do we know what's ATP dependent here? You, you think the SMC is guaranteed not to be? Yeah, so uh, we also did other uh, experiments. For example, uh, we deplete ATP and we found that uh, with depletion of ATP, uh, the MSD is lowered. But if we disable SMC function, then um, the MSD is elevated. So uh, in that case, we know that uh, the, uh, in the experiment, we know that uh, uh, the SMC is not required for the ATP dependent mobility. Hmm, I think it'll be more complicated than that, but uh, there are too many things going together. But anyway, I know what your point is. Okay. But aren't there sort of many classes of, um, yes. you know, SMCs? Like, if you, like, which one did you, did you knock out, like, all of the ones that... Um, we have had lots of confusion on that, right, Right. That's what I'm trying uh, to clarify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, we did uh, experimenting in fishies, so we tried both... Um, uh, cohesion and condensing. So uh, we employ uh, temperature sensitive notations of uh, cohesion and condensing loading factors to disable the SMC function. And for both of them, uh, we observe the same, um, uh, the same behavior. Um, okay, uh, anybody, any additional questions? Okay, and if there are no additional questions, we'll thank the speaker again and move on to the last talk. A couple of minutes early, but that's okay. Uh, the last talk is by Christina Karajin from uh, NYU, Surface Fluctuations and Coalescence of Nucleolar Droplets in the Human Nucleus. My name is Christina Karajin. I'm from the Zadovska lab at New York University, and today I'm going to tell you about nucleolar dynamics and interactions with nucleoplasm in living cells. So recent studies have shown that liquid-liquid phase separation plays a major role in cellular compartmentalization. I'm sure you all are very familiar with that at this point. So the first example is shown in pea granules in the worm embryo. So that's shown down here, where the pea granules in green segregate to one side of the embryo. Also, liquid liquid phase separation was shown to play a role in nucleolar formation in cells. And also recently, heterochromatin has been shown to form by liquid liquid phase separation. As shown down here, we see these two heterochromatin patches fusing over time and they round up into one heterochromatin droplet. However, it's unknown how these droplets interact with the surrounding media. And we know that this could play a role in their material properties. For example, surface tension is a function of both the inside fluid and the outside fluid. So we know that the outside environment can play a role in the material properties of the droplets. And in particular, we want to know how nucleoli interact with the surrounding fluid, which in this case is chromatin. 
So an introduction to the nucleolus, it's the largest organelle in the nucleus. So in this EM image here, this outer boundary is the nucleus, and this blob here is the nucleolus, and you can see how much space it takes up. The nucleolus is also embedded in and tethered to chromatin. So these nucleoli form at genetic regions called nucleolar organizer regions, um, and the number of nucleolar organizer regions you have in a cell is genetically set, so in humans that's 10, and it's also surrounded by a dense layer of heterochromatin. So you can see in this EM image here, this dark patch here is heterochromatin, which sits right next to the nucleolus. The nucleolus is also a site of ribosome biogenesis, so it plays a very important role in cellular maintenance. Um, and when things go, and um, it's also shown to be responsible for cell cycle regulation and also stress response. And when things go wrong, various diseases can arise, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and cancer. And the nucleolus also plays a key role in aging. So understanding how these nucleolar droplets interact with chromatin can help understand these processes and what happens when things go wrong. So the three types of interactions that we analyzed in my lab was studying nucleolar shape fluctuations, then we looked at nuclear fusion, and finally we directly probed the nucleolar chromatin interface using biochemical perturbations. So in this video here, on the left, we see chromatin labeled with H2B GFP, and on the right, we see nucleoli labeled with NPMM apple. And in this video, you can see that it's not static. The surface of the nucleolus moves with time. Well, let's quantify that. So for every frame in our movie, we get nucleolar contours, which are shown here. And you can see that they're not static, as you also saw in the video. These contours change with time, so the nucleolus is moving. And so we define this quantity U, which is the instantaneous contour minus the average contour over the, over the entire frame of our movie. And we then plot U squared as a function of polar angle. So we're now looking at all of the fluctuations along the nucleolus. And you can see that there are fluctuations at various points. And this black curve here shows the fluctuations in a cell fixed with formaldehyde. So um, these fluctuations that we're measuring are above the noise floor, and the nucleolus is truly fluctuating. And from these U square measurements, we can actually extract the surface tension of the nucleolar droplet. So here we are using a temperature of um, 37 degrees Celsius, but even if we were to assume that the cell is, um, even if we were to assume an effective temperature for the cell, this would only change our surface tension measurements by about a factor of two. So we finally get our, for our surface tension. We get uh, an average surface tension of 1.5 micronewtons per meter, which if you're familiar with surface tension measurements, this seems extremely small, but it's actually consistent with the surface tension that was found for nucleoli in frog eggs and also for colloidal polymer systems. And um, this entire experiment here shows that um, the nucleolus is a liquid-like droplet in human cells, which hadn't been shown before. So then we looked at nucleolar fusion. So in this video here, again, the green is chromatin and the red are nucleoli. You can see these two nucleoli coming together, they touch, and then over time, the neck between them grows as the droplets fuse together. And if we were to watch this video for much longer, we would see these nucleoli round up over time into one new spherical droplet. And so I found, oh, so here's another video um, where we're now contouring the nucleolus and we're measuring this neck between the droplets because that's where we're really gonna extract a bunch of rich information. And then on this plot here, we're showing how this neck grows with time. So you can see that it doesn't quite appear to be linear. Uh, maybe it goes like two to one half, but we're not really sure at this point. So we found 14 um, events in total. And while 14 might not seem like a lot, to find these 14 fusion events, we looked through tens of thousands of cells. And from those cells, we found about 100 of them that had nucleoli that were close together in the XY plane, because that's where we have the highest microscope resolution. And from those 100 uh, nucleoli that looked like they could fuse, 14 of them ended up fusing. So this data is from a very large pool of cells. And so then we wanted to see what are the forces that are involved that determine this neck growth. 
And so here um, we looked at how the radius grows, normalized to A, which is the average radius of the droplets prefusion, and the different forces that could be involved. Um, so the one that is um, driving the neck growth is surface tension. And then resisting that growth, you either have the viscosity of the inner fluid or the outer fluid, and the inertia of the inner fluid or the outer fluid. And so we looked at all those different forces, and the ones that the one that fit our model best is where we have surface tension driving the growth of the neck, but now we have the viscosity of the outer fluid that's resisting the growth. So this is very important because we actually find that it's the chromatin solution that's resisting the, the growth of this neck. So chromatin plays a huge role in nucleolar fusion. So when we fit this to our data, we see that the data collapses well. And so like I said, we did try other models as well, and this was the best fit. Um, and so from this data, we can actually extract this tau viscous quantity, which is a function of the viscosity of the nucleoplasm, um, this, neck uh, this droplet radius, which we already know, and the surface tension gamma. So in this plot here on the bottom axis, we have the viscosity of the nucleoplasm divided by um, the surface tension, which is the inverse capillary viscosity. But in our previous measurements, we already have the, uh, the surface tension of the nucleolar droplets. And so we can now extract the viscosity of the nucleoplasm, which is shown in this upper axis here. And we get a viscosity of 3,000 pascal seconds. And again, if you're familiar with this, uh, with viscosity measurements, this might seem like a lot, but this is also consistent with other experiments where they're measuring the viscosity of the chromatin solution. So we were able to obtain the nucleoplasm viscosity from a passive theory, but we know that chromatin is not passive. It's highly active throughout the cell cycle. So these quantities that we're measuring are effective quantities. And what this shows is that chromatin plays the role in nucleolar maintenance, and it's a very important in the life of the nucleolus. So finally, we wanted to directly probe how chromatin and the nucleolus interact. So we have um, different, uh, chemical perturbations here. So we have a control, and then we have cells where we depleted ATP. And then we use two different drugs to um, inhibit transcription. And finally, we looked at a drug which um, decondensed chromatin. And so in this top row, we have chromatin, in the middle, um, the nucleoli, and then the overlays at the bottom. So we measured a variety of quantities, but I'll tell you about two today, which were the um, most striking results. So um, the first thing we measured is the area of the nucleolus divided by the area of the nucleus. And so in this cartoon, that's the area of this red nucleolus divided by the area of the nucleus. And then we also looked at a quantity, the, um, the number of negative regions. So in this nucleolus here, you see these two regions where the curvature of the contour is negative, and those are labeled with in gray. And so this nucleolus would have two negative regions. And so what we're probing with that quantity is how rough is the surface of the nucleolus. So the first thing that we see in this normalized area here is that with one of the transcription inhibition drugs, the area actually increases. And then for chromatin decondensation, the area of the nucleoli on average decreases. And then for the number of negative regions, um, for ATP and both of our transcription inhibition drugs, we go from a nucleolus that might have some regions of negative curvature to something that looks more like a potato, you might say. It just it, The surface is very rough. It's no longer smooth. But for the case of chromatin decondensation, the nucleolus becomes more smooth, much more like a perfect sphere in this case. So you can see that the chromatin interactions do directly play a role on that surface and therefore affect the nucleolus. So in conclusion, we analyzed interactions between chromatin and the liquid-like nucleolus, and we found that the surface tension of the chromatin nucleolus interface is 10 to the minus 6 newton per meter, and we found that the viscosity of the chromatin solution is 10 to the 3 pascal seconds, and we were able to find that non-invasively. So we just looked at the cell and looked at a, a natural probe, the nucleolus, in order to obtain this chromatin viscosity. We also found that chromatin and activity play a role in the maintenance of the nucleolar chromatin interface. And all of these quantities that we measure are likely effective quantities because we're only assuming that this is a passive system when we know that the cell is a highly active environment.
So with that, I would like to thank everyone in my lab, especially Professor Zadowska and Shannon Haley, who were key in this project. Um, I'd also like to thank all of my funding sources, the NIH, NSF, and NYU MRSEC, um, and the organizers for inviting me to give this talk here. Thank you. Thank you. I guess we have a question from Ryan. Hi, Christina. Really nice talk. Um, can I ask a quick question about uh, your comment that um, you had mentioned that when uh, two nucleoli uh, fuse, that uh, interactions with the uh, with chromatin is sort of um, leading to the sort of the resistance of this fusion. So is, is this because uh, certain chromatin contacts with the nucleoli need to be broken, or is it because uh, you know those contacts are maintained, and essentially pulling this chromatin leads to some sort of local rearrangement of chromatin? Um, right, so how should I think about this? So you can think about it in two ways. So the nucleoli, they form at those um, gene regions, and then they always pull them with them. So when two nucleoli coalesce, they are pulling those regions of chromatin with them. So in that case, those have to come along for the ride and is acting as resistance. But what we also saw is that the chromatin around the neck, as it moves away from the neck, which allows it to grow, that speed directly matches um, natural chromatin motion. So it's likely that as the chromatin is just naturally moving away, that's what's allowing the neck to grow. So it's two ways that's uh, resisting. I see. Uh, so it really can't can ever break. I mean, the, the, the um, interactions between the nucleoli and the, and the chromatin, uh, they're, they're actually very stable. They don't like come apart. No, so actually if the nucleolus is to leave that section of chromatin that it's attached to, it will dissolve. So you need that piece to even have the nucleolus to begin with. And it, it's um, been seen that once you have a large nucleolus, for example, it contains all of the um, chromatin pieces that it was sitting on from the beginning. So if a nucleolus is made of 10 little nucleoli, you have all of those gene regions looped inside that single nucleolus. Interesting. Thank you so much. We have another question from Adam, Adam Carlson. Uh, thank you, that was a very nice talk. Um, I was wondering about different cell types and do you know if the biophysical properties of a nucleoli such as its density or, or, or surface tension vary depending on the cell type if you for example would compare the nucleoli and how they look like how full how rippled they are on their surface in in ES cells or in, in differentiated cells is there did, did anybody look, did you or anybody that you know might have looked at that? Is there any correlation there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. We haven't looked at it, but that it's def definitely something we'd like to explore because if we can use the nucleoli to probe the chromatin, we can directly measure if there's a difference in the chromatin properties in these cell types without, um, you know, directly probing it with injections and things like that. Um, but I, I don't know of any work that has looked at that. Thank you. Uh, I had a question, I guess, about functionality. I mean, what happens if you knock out and now you start with only nine, uh, you knock out one of those start sites? Does anything happen? I mean, is this somehow very orchestrated or is this just happens to be evolutionarily what happened and it works fine and uh, everybody's, and, and, and we shouldn't look in the details for a functional role for all the precise uh, uh, aspects that you, you, you talked about? Mm -hmm. So, um... I'm sure there have been experiments that looked at that. I don't know them off the top of my head. But because these gene regions act as nucleation sites for the nucleoli, I would imagine that it would continue without issue. It's not that orchestrated. They just act as nucleation sites for the nucleoli. OK, so I'm just curious whether if you knock out one of those, you start with nine, does that somehow you know, give rise to some important phenotypic difference or not? I have, I, OK, I'm curious. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's it. I don't see any additional questions, in which case uh, we can thank all the speakers and clap for everybody and uh, have a all good evening. Thank you.